Welcome to the fourth lesson in our series, Investigating Electromagnetic Radiation. So far in the series, we have explored the properties of electromagnetic radiation. We have shown that there are different types of electromagnetic radiation described in the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember, visible light is part of the spectrum and can be broken up into a spectrum of different colors of light each with their own frequency. In this lesson, we are going to explore what happens when light is shone on different surfaces containing chemicals called pigments. We will also examine how scientists use the interaction of light and matter to produce both emission and absorption spectra for different materials. These spectra can be used to analyze the composition of the materials. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how pigments give objects their color, show how different colors of paints can be obtained by mixing different pigments together, describe the difference between emission and absorption spectra, and solve problems by analyzing a spectrum. Let's start by looking at what happens when white light falls on an object. Remember, we see an object because light is reflected from the object and enters our eyes. So why do we see a green leaf in sunlight as green? Well, even though white light falls on the leaf, the leaf only reflects green light. The energy of all the other frequencies of light is absorbed. All objects contain chemicals which are capable of absorbing one or more colors of white light. These chemicals are known as pigments. We make use of these pigments in paints and dyes. We see an object is red because the chemical or pigment on its surface absorbs all the colors of the spectrum except for red. Red light is then reflected off the surface and we perceive the color of the object as red. Now, when we mix two pigments together, they retain their ability to absorb only certain frequencies of light. So the color we see is actually a combination of the frequencies of light that both pigments reflect. We've seen earlier in the series that if we mix the primary colors of light, red, green, and blue together, we get white light. Let's go and ask an expert if the same would happen with paint. Hi Simone, could you tell us what would happen if we mixed red, green and blue together? Would we get white? No, you would definitely not get white because if you actually had to mix those colours together you would get a dirty brown. What are the primary colours of paint? The primary colours of paint are magenta being your red, cyan, your blue and your yellow. And why are these the primary colours? These are your primary colours because they, they cannot be made from any other combination of paints. And would you be able to mix a uh, green paint for us? Yes, let me do that now. Green paint is made with the yellow and the cyan. And then I'm just going to mix the e in equal quantities. And how would we make that green lighter or darker? You would you um, make this lighter and darker by adding white or black to it. Okay, so the white to make it lighter yes. and the black to make it yes. darker. So if if I had to add this white to the green, it's a little bit there. You can see this is actually yeah. a different green. It's lighter, and the same with if you want to make it darker, you add black, and then. Um, if you're using different percentages of your blue and yellow together, 
you actually get a different frequency of your green. So with more yellow, with the cyan added, you get a lighter green. More cyan with a lower percentage of yellow, you get a darker green. Okay, but it's all still basically yes, green, just a different green. frequency. Okay, fantastic, thank you. That was interesting. Notice that the cyan paint, also called primary blue, the magenta, also called primary red, and the yellow paints do not look the same as the same color we got with light. The colors are more intense because there are more pigments present. Look, when a small amount of the paint called cyan is spread out over a white surface, the blue color is almost the same as the cyan we saw with light. Let's see if we can discuss what we have just seen in more detail. Remember, when we examined light, we found that the primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. We found that when we mix the primary colors of light, we get white light. The primary colors of light cannot be made from any other colors of light, but all other colors of light can be made by combining them in different ways. Now, when we work with paint, Red, green, and blue are no longer the primary colors. Cyan, yellow, and magenta are the primary colors of pigments because they cannot be made from pigments of any other colors, and we can make all other colors from them. When we mix the primary colors together, we get secondary colors. So the green paint we saw being mixed is a secondary color. It was produced by mixing cyan and yellow pigments. Let's explore why these two pigments together produce the color green. Remember, cyan light is formed by combining green and blue light. So a cyan pigment only reflects green and blue light. All the other colors of light are absorbed by the pigment. Yellow light is formed by combining red and green light. So a yellow pigment only reflects red and green light. And all the other colors are absorbed. By carefully looking at these two diagrams, can you now explain why the combination of cyan and yellow pigments results in the color green? Well, when we mix cyan and yellow pigments together, the only color that is not absorbed by this combination is green. We therefore see green because that is the only color reflected. Remember, Yellow and cyan are primary pigment colors, and magenta is the third. You should now be able to explain how to make other secondary colors, such as red and blue, by mixing pairs of primary pigment colors together. But there's one more possible type of mixing that we need to think about. When we mix a secondary color with a primary color, we get another set of colors, which are called tertiary colors. This chart can help you remember which colors are primary, secondary, and tertiary. We start with the three primary pigment colors and draw in a triangle to link them together. When two primary colors are mixed together, they form a secondary color. Three triangles can be drawn on the sides of the first triangle to show the formation of the three secondary colors, red, blue, and green. We can now repeat the process on each side of the triangle to form the six tertiary colors. So, if you are thinking of mixing some paints, make sure you understand how pigments and light interact. Now, another way in which light interacts with matter provides scientists with some very useful analytical tools called spectra. In this lesson, we are going to examine two types of spectra, absorption spectra and emission spectra. Let's first look at emission spectra. When white light is passed through a prism or diffraction grating, the light splits up into the spectrum of different colors, from red to violet. The spectrum appears as a continuous band of colors. There are no sharp boundaries between the colors. This kind of spectrum is called a continuous emission spectrum. A continuous emission spectrum is, however, not the only type of emission spectrum that can form. Scientists use an instrument called a gas discharge tube to form another important type of emission spectrum. 
This discharge tube containing hydrogen gas is connected to a very high voltage source which causes the hydrogen gas to glow. When the light from this discharge tube is passed through a prism or diffraction grating, the spectrum produced by the glowing hydrogen gas is not a continuous spectrum but forms a series of bright lines. We call this kind of spectrum a line emission spectrum. Now, watch what happens when a different discharge tube filled with helium gas is used. Notice the spectral lines are not the same as for hydrogen. This is because each element has a unique line emission spectrum, as the spectral lines are related to the unique arrangement of electrons in each atom. To understand why only some colors are seen, we need to take a closer look at what is happening on a microscopic level by looking inside the atom. The electrons in an atom can only have certain specific or permitted energies called energy levels. When electrons in an atom gain energy, they become excited and are able to jump to another energy level further from the nucleus. Once an electron has jumped to another energy level, we say that the electron is excited but unstable. So the electron will return to its original energy level and when it does this, it will release the energy it gained when it became excited. Remember, the energy the electron loses or gains is always in specific values that are unique to each element because energy is quantized. In other words, it comes in packets or quanta. When an excited electron drops down to a lower energy level again, the energy is released as a photon of light. The energy of the emitted photon equals the energy difference between the two energy levels. Since the atoms of each element have a unique set of energy levels, the frequencies of light that can be emitted are unique to each element and can be used to identify that element. Can you recall an equation that can relate the value of the energy and the specific frequency of the light emitted from the electrons? Well, we can use Planck's equation. That is, energy emitted is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. So this red line on the hydrogen line emission spectrum corresponds directly to the movement of an electron between two energy levels that are close together. But the blue line corresponds to energy levels that are further apart. So far, we have examined line emission spectra in detail. Remember, these spectra are formed because the substance in the discharged tube is releasing energy in the form of light. Now, let's turn our attention to the second type of spectrum, the absorption spectrum. An absorption spectrum is formed when light is passed through a cold, dilute gas. The atoms in the gas absorb photons of light at characteristic frequencies. As a result, the light that passes through the gas produces a spectrum without the absorbed frequencies. These gaps appear as black lines. To explain why these black lines form in an absorption spectrum, we need to have a closer look at what is happening at an atomic level. When light passes through the gas, the electrons in the lower energy levels absorb packets of energy from the light and are excited and so move up into higher energy levels. These excited electrons cannot stay at the higher energy levels and so drop back to the ground state and release energy as photons. However, these photons do not travel in the same direction as the original source of light. This results in a spectrum that has dark lines in it, corresponding to the frequencies of the light absorbed. Just as with line emission spectra, each element has its own characteristic atomic absorption spectrum, which can be used to identify the element. Now, let's see these spectra used in practice. At Mintec, they use a machine called an atomic absorption spectrometer to determine the concentrations of an element in a sample accurately.
Before using the machine, the emission and the absorption spectra of the element are examined. A cathode tube which emits light with the wavelength of one of the lines is chosen as the light source. Here is a light source with a wavelength of 589 nanometers which is used to test samples containing sodium ions. Different solutions of known concentrations are used first to establish a standard. The liquid from each sample is sucked up and heated in a flame. Notice the flame changes color, indicating that the atoms in the solution have all changed to a gas. When the light from the cathode shines through the gas, detectors inside the machine record how much light has been absorbed by each sample. Next, samples with an unknown concentration of ions are tested in the same way. The amount of light absorbed by the test samples is compared with the data record from the samples with known concentrations, and so the unknown concentration can be determined. Isn't it nice to know that the things you learn have practical applications? On that note, here's your task for today. When a helium emission spectrum is produced, one of the lines is yellow. The frequency of this yellow light is 5,1 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Calculate the energy of the photon that was emitted to produce this light. What would you notice on the absorption spectrum of helium at the same frequency? Well, that's all for this lesson. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.